few minutes ago, Mark really, uh, really put the pressure on me because he told God that I would have a really great lesson today, and I just, you know, that kind of raises the bar there a little bit. You know, one of the beautiful things about what the church should be, and I think what we have here is we, we all bring different things when we come together. Some of us sing well, some of us not so much. Um, we all serve in different ways, we bring different experiences, we all, you know, some of us are really, really happy right now, some of us are really, really sad right now. Uh, some of us have a lot of physical suffering that we're going through, a lot of anxiety, Others of us are feeling great, happy and carefree and doing fine. That's the beauty of the church is that God brings all of that together under the umbrella of the cross. And he, he puts us here for each other. And, you know, when I'm down, you can lift me. When you're down, I can lift you. We help each other. The goal is to get to heaven together. And by the way, we appreciate, uh, let me add my, my word to, to Mark's in prayer about these young guys that served at the table. They did a great job. You know, I don't know of many churches where you could attend and hear young voices like that leading prayer at the Lord's table. That's awesome. And, and uh, we've got some, some young adult men who are working with those kids. And uh, they're doing a good job. In fact, we have even thought about getting some of those young adult men to work with some of our older guys <laughs> to, to get them uh, on, on board, too. But we are, uh, we are glad you're here. I, I'm just glad to be here, aren't you? It's a good place to be. And, you know, we take a little time out of our busy lives to remind ourselves that sometimes life is too busy. And we forget to focus on what's really important. Would you join with me in our confession together? I am a child of God. I am saved by grace. I live each day by faith. I'm ready to hear God's word. I hope he'll have a word for you. We're going to stand for the reading of Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Another one-to-one -one conversation with Jesus and somebody else. Matthew tells us this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, Hey, if you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Could he have done it? Of course. But Jesus said to him, No, the Scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So then the devil took him to the holy city, to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you're the Son of God, jump off. For even the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they'll hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, you know, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. So next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. I'll give it all to you, he said, if you'll just kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God. And serve only him. And then the devil went away for a little while. And the angels came and took care of Jesus. May God bless us as we study this passage and his people said. Amen. Amen. What a great passage. Kids, we're going to dismiss you for your lesson. We love you guys. One and all and all in one. Hey, our, uh, our uh, backpack gift uh bucket our big uh, jar jug can bucket thing out there is is 
filling up nicely. Drop a little bit in there. We're going to, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be buying gifts and getting ready to hand those out to our backpack kids at Doyle Elementary. So uh, be a part of that. Just, just be a part of it. That's what we're all doing. Everybody okay this morning? Or at least you're present, right? <laughs> we don't always come okay, right? And that's, and that's okay. So I want us to study together these one-on-one -on -one conversations with Jesus and individuals. And today I want us to look at the question of saying no to Satan. You know, of all the people Jesus talks to, and he talks to who? Nicodemus, the woman at the well of Samaria, the woman caught in adultery, Zacchaeus. He talks to Peter and Andrew and James and John and this person and that person. He talks to his parents. He talks to the priests. He talks to Pontius Pilate. He talks to Herod Antipas. He talks to, you know, all these different people. You ever stop to talk or to think about the fact that Jesus once talked with Satan? Yeah. He actually, you know, mano y mano, face to face, one on one. With Satan. I'll bet you've had that happen in your life at one time or another. Let's, uh, let's set our stage and think about this. Have you ever felt, do you ever feel like Satan has you under attack? Do you ever feel like that? Now, uh, there are times in all of our lives when I think we feel like he's leaving us alone for a little bit. We don't really know why, but, you know, we're grateful. Um... But at one time or another in life, Satan just climbs all over you. And it seems like he always comes around at the worst possible times. He got a knack for that. One of these days, we need to do three or four lessons on Satan. You really need to know this guy. You really need to know how he operates. You know, one of the keys to winning in a football game is you got to study the other team and find out what their strategies are. You teach your players, if they line up in this formation and this guy's over here, I guarantee you, I, I love to listen to, to ball games where one of the commentators is like a former quarterback, and he'll sit there, and when they line up, he'll tell you what play they're going to run. They'll line up, and they'll say, oh, this is going to, the halfback's going to flare out to the right, and he's going to throw a short pass. And sure enough, that's ex nine times out of ten, that's exactly what they do. Why? Because he understands the strategy. He understands tendencies. Satan has tendencies. Satan has strategies. And the more we understand that, and the more we understand ourselves, the safer we're going to keep ourselves from his attacks. So this idea of being under attack by Satan is something we need to be very aware of as Christians. And, and this is what Jesus talks about when he meets Satan, in the story we're going to look at today. So let's look at our story. Let's take a look at Satan. I'm not going to give you a thorough theological analysis of Satan and all of his strategies. But let's look at what's going on as far as the, the back story here to, to what happens in Matthew 4. Jesus has just been baptized. Now, you would think that when a person is baptized, they would be at a very strong point in their life. They've just made a decision for Christ. They've just chosen to do the right thing. They've just obeyed the will of the Lord. They come out of the waters washed of sin, raised to walk in newness of life, added to the family of God, clothed in Jesus. That all sounds great, but it's actually one of your weakest moments. And the fact that you have become a follower of Jesus puts a great big set of crosshairs on your back. Because there is nobody Satan wants worse than a new convert. Because everybody's going to know you've just come to Jesus. Everybody knows you've just become a Christian. You're telling everybody. You're all excited. You're voicing it out to everybody. And Satan says, boy, if I can just flip him upside down if I can turn her off right now boy look at how stupid it's going to make those church people look 
they're going to think this whole thing's just a big emotional roller coaster and this person just got sucked in with a bunch of emotion and yeah, it's going to be great. So Satan will just climb all over you. Now those of you who have become Christians in recent months and years, you know this is true. When you first become a Christian, I think part of it is you're more aware of what's expected now and you're wanting to do what's right. And that makes you more aware of what's out there that's not what's right. So the awareness is one thing. But the thing is, Satan will throw the whole kitchen sink and everything under it all over you. And he does it with Jesus. You might remember this story. Matthew has this right at the end of chapter 3. He says, Jesus went from Galilee down to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John, this is interesting, I've never seen another example of this. John tried to talk him out of it. We spend all our time trying to talk people into it, don't we? And here John's trying to talk Jesus out of it. Why? Because there's no point. What's baptism for? Remission of sins. What sins? Jesus, uh, John's not a dummy. He knows who Jesus is. He knows he's the Son of God. He knows he's sinless. He knows he's lived a perfect life. And Jesus comes and says, I'm here to be baptized. And John says, why? I, I need you to baptize me. I, you're perfect. You know, all these other people I baptized, we're washing their sins away. You don't have any. Jesus responds. John tried to talk him out of it. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, John said. So are, why are you coming to me? I don't think he's being a smart aleck. I think he's just asking a straightforward question there. Jesus said it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. Boy, that's a profound statement. Does God require baptism? Read this verse. John says, why do you need to be baptized? Obviously not for theological reasons. You're not in sin, and therefore Jesus says, no, but it's something God is going to require every member of the kingdom of God to do, and I'm not going to ask my people to go where I'm not willing to go myself. So let's do it. Let's do it to fulfill, to be an example and show people where God is going to take us. And so John agreed to baptize him, and after his baptism, Jesus came up out of the water, and the heavens opened, and the Spirit of God descended like a dove, settled on him, and a voice from heaven came down. This is impressive. None of this happened when I was baptized. I just got wet, came out, and that was it. But all of this, and the voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Why did Jesus give him great joy? Because Jesus did what God requires. That's all Jesus ever lived to do, wasn't it? What God required. Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Always number one on his list. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteous ways. And all this other stuff you'll get anyway. So Jesus lived what he preached. And that's a beautiful thing. Jesus is about to begin his saving ministry. Now what good Satan in the world is going to want that to happen? You know, Satan's sitting here saying, now listen. Jesus just was baptized as an act of inauguration. If you want to look at it this way, Jesus' baptism was in a sense his formal ordination into his work as a prophet. Okay, it's his graduation. It's his, it's his graduation out of seminary, if you please. He's getting ready. He is getting ready to flip the religious world upside down and satan knows what's coming and so what does he do he shows up with the kitchen sink and all the stuff in it he is going to do his very best and i'm going to tell you something anytime you take up on yourself to do a good work for god head a ministry teach a class do a good work uh, start a program, uh, serve in a ministry. Anytime you step up to volunteer, 
Satan's going to throw everything he has at you. He wants, he's going to distract you. He's going to get you busy. He's going to have a bunch of people come around with needs. Can you do this? Can you do that? He's going to, he's going to prey on your, on your good Samaritan nature. He's going to prey on your fix-it-all in nature. He's going to work on that and get you so engaged in other stuff that you don't have time to really do what God has called you to do and what you were going to do. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever have you ever decided to do something and then just kind of kind of two or three good hard weeks and then you just kind of gas out of it? Yeah, he does that, doesn't he? It's amazing how he can just he and he seems to know just the right thing to do. Isn't that isn't that remarkable? So, what does he do? He gets Jesus off what? Alone. And does what he does best. By the way, Anytime he can, Satan will isolate you from this church. He will isolate you from this fellowship. He will drag you away and get you off. He'll, he'll make you think that you're all by yourself. He'll tell you nobody cares. He'll tell you they're all just a bunch of holy people and you aren't good enough. He'll tell you, he'll tell you all kinds of stuff in your head to convince you to not stay connected because connected is what keeps you in the kingdom, and disconnected is the first step out the door. And that's just true. That's just true. That's why when anybody starts missing pretty regular, we need to start asking what's going on. You know, I always got amused year, in years gone by. I, I've seen many churches operate. And we got some churches that are into this thing about, you know, we're going to disfellowship people that aren't living the way they should. So what they do is they take somebody that hasn't been to church for two years and they announce that they're disfellowshipping them. From what? What are you taking away from them? Your bad thoughts? They haven't been there in two years. You can't take fellowship away. They don't have any. Now, what that means is this. We need to make fellowship such a wonderful thing that when a person thinks about taking it away or walking away from it, it really gives them pause to think, do I really want to give this up? Not that I've been gone two years and, oh, you finally noticed me just long enough to send a letter out. Thank you. That's just so crazy. And it's a, it's a gross misunderstanding of what God wants the church to be. Satan will always isolate you if he can to try to work on your mind because he doesn't want those reasoned voices of faithful Christians saying, hey, listen, that's just Satan talking to you. He doesn't want that. He likes to get you off alone, and he does it with Jesus. Even though the Holy Spirit actually drives him to the wilderness, as, as is said, let's, let's look at this conversation and we'll see what happens. Satan appeals. Now, Satan attacks Jesus in three areas. Uh, he might just attack you in one. It depends on what your weak spot is. He might attack you in five areas. He might attack you in a dozen areas. It just depends on what you're, what you're vulnerable to. And by the way, what Satan attacks you on may not have anything to do with me. You know, what, what bothers me, you might look at it and say, that's stupid. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Now, I don't drink alcohol. I don't drink any kind of alcohol at all. Just don't do it. Never have, never will. Just not interested. Okay? I have a really hard time, and I'm a counselor. I have a hard time understanding alcoholism. I have a hard time understanding how somebody cannot just say, that's not good for me. I don't want it. I, don't, I can't understand why a person feels compelled to stop at the store and buy a six-pack on the way home knowing they're going to sit there all night and get drunk. I, I don't understand that. I, don't, I can't. Now, that, that doesn't mean I don't care and that I don't feel compassionate. I just don't get it because that's just not an issue for me and never has been. I can walk past the alcohol counter, I can walk in a liquor store, walk around in there all day long, and I don't see anything that even gets my attention. 
It's not an area of Satan. Now, there are other areas where Satan just wears me out. I am a horrendous procrastinator. Maybe one of the worst ever. Now, Satan will work on my schedule and my commitments, and he'll destroy me on that. But I won't get so depressed that I'll go buy me some liquor to forget about it. See, that's what I'm saying. That's not my temptation. So you figure out yours. By the way, if you're going to be faithful to God, you'd better figure out what he does in your life. You'd better figure out what he's doing with you. Because analyzing my issues is not going to get you to heaven. You've got to figure out what he's going to do to you. So, Satan appeals to Jesus' hunger. Well, that's normal, isn't it? We all get hungry. Let's look at verses 1 to 3. It says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil, and for 40 days and 40 nights he fasted. Now, that's a long time. I have trouble fasting between 8 and 12. By 3, I'm starting to get grumpy. By 4.30, you better stay out of my way. I'm usually hitting a restaurant somewhere or going somewhere or I'm going through the cabinet. You know what I'm saying? I think a lot of us have that issue in our lives. Jesus fasted for 40 days. Now, that tells me something about his extraordinary strength of will. But it's personal will. It's human will. And it takes more than that. So Satan comes to him. He became very hungry. Duh. You want to put that in parenthesis there, don't you? Duh. During that time, the devil came to him and said, now notice the language. And every time he tempts him, he says this. If you're the son of God. See? That's a little ego thing, isn't it? If you're the son of God, uh, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Could he have done it? Sure. In fact, we know he can manufacture bread out of nothing because in five loaves and two fish, he fed 5,000 people. So it's not like producing food is a difficult issue for Jesus. In fact, he took five loaves and two fish, fed 5,000, and had 12 baskets left over. So turning a rock, and by the way, why the stones? Because the stones... In that part of the world, a lot of the stones on the ground are round and shaped. They're volcanic-type stones, and they look just like loaves of bread. They, they actually look like it. And, you know, when you haven't eaten in 40 days and you see that stone, it looks like a lump of, it looks like a loaf of bread. Oh, you can almost smell it coming out of the oven. And how easy would it be for a man with the amazing, miraculous power of Jesus to just go, wouldn't have been that that would have been that would have been child's play. I mean, he can raise the dead and walk on water. Yeah, he can make he can make bread out of a rock anytime he wants to. So the issue was not his power. But what he's doing is he's appealing to his physical needs, his hunger. And by the way, physical needs are a very powerful driving force in our lives, aren't they? What does Jesus do? He tells Satan you need to focus on God's food. Quit worrying about all this stuff you eat. Don't worry about what you eat. Think about what you consume in your heart. Okay? And this is the way Jesus put it. Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say. Notice his response. No. And then what does he do? He quotes the Bible, doesn't he? He quotes the book of Deuteronomy. People don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He says, listen, you know, my purpose in fasting is to get my head together and to focus on the will of God and the mission of God in my life. That's the word of God. And you're wanting me to think about eating something. I'm not out here to think about eating. If I want to eat, I'll go to El Tap up in Jerusalem. You didn't know there was one there? They, the archaeologists just found it recently. Got these bright colored tiles on the wall and 
It's really nice. Um, Jesus is trying to get Satan to realize, look, my focus is on the will of God in my life and what God is saying to me through his word. And, and that's more important than worrying about eating something. So if you're sitting here and you haven't had breakfast and, you know, you're looking at lunch in 30 minutes and you're thinking, I wish he'd shut up and sit down so I could go eat, you might want to think about that. Just saying. So what does Satan do? Well, he's appealed to Jesus' physical needs, his sense of, of, of desire. What does he go after next? Well, Satan then attacks Jesus' sense of fairness. He really does. I want you to think about this. What is one of the most common things that you hear people say? That's not fair. And you know something? On a human scale, from the standpoint of my comfort in life and my overall happiness in life, there are a lot of things that aren't fair, aren't there? There really are. And I don't mean, sometimes I've told you before, I used to tell my kids at school, well, they'd say it's not fair, and I'd say, well, the fair only comes once a year, and it's already over this year. And, you know, you can say that kind of in an amusing kind of way, but it is true that there are times when life just really isn't fair. Look at Job. What does Job say to God in the book of Job after all the things that happened to him? He basically looks at God and says, look, I'm no worse than anybody else, but what's happened to me is not fair. Nobody, hey, nobody has sinned this much. Nobody deserves this bad of stuff. That's not fair. Fair is one of the big questions in the world. You think about this young Jake Morris that just passed away. That's not fair. What's fair about a 38-year-old young man who dies from a horrible disease and leaves a newborn baby behind? Now, that's not fair. But then this world that we live in is a fallen, sinful world, and it is by definition unfair. The world we live in is an unfair place. We don't all compete on equal footing. We don't all have equal opportunity. Much of what you enjoy in your life is simply the accident of your birth. You were born in the right country, into the right family, in the right area, at the right time. That's why our lives are as good as they are. If you had been born in Bangladesh in 64, or in Vietnam in 65, or in China in 66 during the, the purges of Mao Zedong? Or in Papa Joe's Russia in the 1930s? Or in Germany or Austria in 1941? <laughs> you wouldn't have anything like what you have now. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have any concept of what fair is. Imagine being Jewish in Poland in 1939 just an accident of birth now am I thankful to God for it you bet but it doesn't make me better than anybody else it just makes me very incredibly blessed but Satan questions this idea of fairness he tries to get Jesus to blame God for something it's God's fault first of all the author of sin the author of death the author of suffering the author of pain, the offering of author of disease, it's not God. It's the other guy. That's his stuff. Because the Bible says that when Jesus overcomes Satan, he also overcomes death. Why? He killed the author. The devil took him to the holy city, to Jerusalem. Took him up on the high point of the temple. He could look down. It's probably 300 feet down to the, the rocks below. And then he says, again, common refrain, if you are the son of God. Again, trying to play with that doubt. Jump off. And then he quotes the Bible. Did you know that Satan, probably Satan knows the Bible almost as well as Jesus. And Jesus is the author. Satan knows it almost, I'll bet you Satan studies the Bible every day. But he's not looking for the will of God, is he? 
He's looking for mistakes. He's looking for contradictions. He's looking for uh, phrases that can be isolated and proof texted out and twisted. And that's what he's looking for. And you hear it all the time. You ever heard people quote the Bible to you and you look at them and you say, what? Well, yeah, it's right there in the Bible. Hey, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. There's a place in the Bible that said Judas went out and hanged himself. And a few verses before that, it says, go thou and do likewise. Does that mean I'm supposed to go hang myself because Judas did? I mean, come on. If you're going to hunt and jump and peck around and pull out verses here and there, you can say just about anything you want to say, and our world shows us that. So Satan is a master at using this kind of stuff. He says, God will order his angels to protect you. Is that true? Yes. He'll hold you up with their hands and you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Is that true? Yes. When Jesus was on the cross, he says, listen, make no mistake. All I have to do is snap my finger and you people are toast. I can call down the hosts of heaven on your head. I choose not to. But he could have. And in the end of time, he will. In fact, the book of Revelation says the day will come when Jesus will roll up this earth like an old coat and toss it in a corner. That's how, that's how pointless it is to him. So he goes after this sense of fairness. Well, now, you know, if you jump off, God will take care of you. God is fair. You know, God does keep his word, doesn't he? Can't, you can trust God, can't you? Now, you do trust God. I want to make sure, Jesus, that, I mean, how can you be the son of God and not trust God? You do trust God, don't you? I mean, you got to step out there and take your chances and let God do what he says he's going to do. Jesus tells him to focus on God's integrity. Look, my, my job is not to focus on God's power, but on God's integrity. What do I mean by integrity? God does what he says he'll do. Jesus says, I don't have to test God to know that he can do it. I trust the knowledge that he can do it. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Now, there's times in life when that's hard to believe. But do you trust in the integrity of God, that God keeps his word? Well, this is the way it was put. Jesus responded, the scriptures also, he says, okay, you want to quote the Bible. By the way, don't ever get to quoting the Bible with God. I don't care how well you know the Bible, he wrote it, okay? He knows it. Jesus says, okay, you want to quote the Bible? How about the verse that says, you don't test the Lord your God? Why? You trust in God's integrity. You trust in God's integrity. You know, if God has to prove every single thing to you, then you're not walking by faith. You're walking by sight. Well, I'll only believe it if God shows me he can do it. Well, then you're walking by sight. You're not walking. By. What does Jesus say? Jesus says to Thomas when he shows him the wounds on his, on his hands and in his side, he looks at Thomas and he says, you have seen and have touched and you believe. Blessed are those who come after you who will not touch and will not see and yet believe anyway. Paul calls that walking by faith rather than by sight. I don't have to test God because God's proven himself faithful through all the ages. So, the last thing Satan goes after is the one thing that is probably a, an area of weakness for all of us. He goes after the ego. He says, all right, hot shot. You say you're the son of God. Doesn't it seem appropriate to you that the son of God should rule the whole world? Hey, let me tell you something, big guy. I can make that happen for you. Now, this is, the, this is the assumption. Satan basically looks at Jesus and says, you know, I own this world. And he does, by the way. We sing that song, this is my father's world, only in the sense of creation. This is not God's world. This world was co-opted by Satan a long time ago. This is Satan's world. The governments of this world, the philosophies of this world, the morals of this world, the economies of this world, they're all dominated by Satan and, and his children and their way of thinking. That's one reason why God says when Jesus comes, he's going to dump this world, burn it up, and create a new heavens and a new earth, and that will be my Father's world. 
because it will be a place that is perfect where no sin and no unbelief and no ungodliness will be permitted. Now that's my father's world. So Satan basically says to Jesus, let me tell you something. You see all those kingdoms of the world? They're mine. And I can give them to you if you want them. All you got to do is cross your fingers, cross your toes, get down on your knees, bow your head and say, Lord, Satan, one time, just say it. It's just words. And I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. That's how easy Satan makes it sound sometimes. But it's not. So, Satan looks at him. And he says, takes him to the peak of the very high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He says, I'll give it all to you if you'll kneel down and worship me. Now, that's it. At this point, Jesus is done with him. He's kind of pushed on some things. You know, feed yourself. Eh, I don't need it that bad. Oh, come on. Jump off the, the temple and, and test God. Uh, listen, I don't have to test God to know that God keeps his word. He says, how about if I offer you, what if I offer to make you the richest man in the world? What if I offer you all the pleasure, all the luxury, all the power, all the everything the world has? I mean all of it. You ever watch these shows on TV where they show you these ridiculous RVs, that they, these hyper-designed RVs that have all this amazing stuff? Have you ever seen those? Or where they take a car and they pimp it up and make it some kind of spectacular rolling whatever. You ever seen the ones with the, the most fantastic houseboats or the, the most amazing uh, vacation spots in the world? I want to go to one of those out in the Pacific Ocean where they build the, 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 the room out on the, uh, on the edge of the bay and you actually sleep over the bay. Now, that, would, that would be cool. You know, I mean, hey, there's all kinds of stuff out there. Satan looks at Jesus and says, you can have all that stuff. All you got to do is worship me. What's Jesus' answer? He says, you need to focus on God's sovereignty. What does that mean? God outranks everything else. If there is a mountain, God sits on the top of it. And there's nothing even close. If we were ranking them like they're going to do these football teams, this afternoon we're going to find out who's 1, 2, 3, and 4. With God, it's 1, 36, 37, 38. Okay? God is absolutely sovereign. You shall have no other gods before me. Period. First commandment. Jesus tells him, look, you need to focus on God's sovereignty. He says, get out of here. James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And by the way, that word serve is important too. Who are you serving? So what does Satan do? Well, he throws a curve at Jesus. Jesus gets a single. He throws another curve at Jesus. He hits another single. He throws a high inside fastball at him. Jesus strokes it out of the park. So, Satan jerks himself off the pitcher mound and says, okay, that's it. I'm done for now. I might. So, what does he do? He leaves for a little while. Notice this. Then the devil went away, and angels came and took care of Jesus. He leaves. I, the reason I put for a little while is because he never leaves for good. If you've ever been through a tempting time in life, a hard time in life when Satan attacked you, even if you got through it and things went great and you're feeling good and now you feel like you're on the road back, what happens three months from now? Yeah. You get a diagnosis. You have a surgery that doesn't work out the way you wanted it to. Something happens at home. You get fired from your job. Or maybe you just meet an old friend that you've missed seeing a long time. 
you're a guy and this was a girl you knew a long time ago and even though you're married and things are going well, you know, she still got that smile and still knows how to talk well and have a good conversation and so you meet and have coffee together and guess who's back? Guess who's back knocking at the door? He does that, doesn't he? Let me give you three quick ones out of this. Personal takeaways. My spell checker tells me, by the way, that takeaways is not an appropriate word. So I left it that way anyway. <clears throat> when you preach, you're allowed to invent your own words. Let me give you three. Number one, Satan's goal is to attack you early and often. Mm hmm Early and often. You gotta, hey, you got to bring your A game every day. You got to be ready to go in any time. Because you never know when he's going to show up. You know. Number two, Satan's strategy is to probe you for weaknesses. Now, you may be real strong. You may, how many of you have been in the church for, how many of you have been a Christian for 20 years? Raise your hands. Come on. Okay. Uh, keep them up. 30? 40? We're thinning out, aren't we? 50? Any of you been Christians 50 years? Yeah. 60. Oh, look at that, man. You're telling on yourself, dude. Hey, look here. 70. Grandma over here, she's, she's been a Christian 236 years. And Satan don't tempt her anymore because he took him out. He took, she took him out to the woodshed and whooped him up good. <laughs> Hey, he is constantly looking for weaknesses. And by the way, let me tell you this. As you go through the seasons of life and the different years of your life and the different ages of your life, those weaknesses change. And what worked, 20, what worked on me when I was 18, don't bother me so much now. But boy, there's a bunch of stuff now that bugs me. You know? And you'll find that as life changes, as your circumstances change, as your health changes, all those things, he is constantly saying, okay, where can I go now? And he may have tried something on you at age 25 that didn't work, but if it'll work at 50, guess what? He'll try it again just to see. That's the way he operates. You've got to be aware of that. You've got to be aware when you're in a war zone that there are minefields. And so you don't just get crazy one night and you go, woohoo, let's celebrate and take off running across a field. You won't make it 18 feet before it gets, blows you to pieces. You don't do that. Especially if there's a sign on the, on the fence that says, minefield ahead. That's what the Word of God's there for, is to tell you that's God putting up signs saying, Hey, dude, there's a minefield out here. There's one over here. There's one over here. Don't go running through that. Walk around that. You live longer, physically and spiritually. The last point is this. Your most effective tool against Satan is... Now, why do I say that? Why do I say scripture? Why not prayer? Why not fellowship? Why not faith? Why not? And we could put a lot of words in there. But what does Jesus turn to every single time Satan raises a question? He goes to the word. Satan says, make yourself some bread. Jesus quotes the Bible. Satan says, put God to the test. Jesus quotes the Bible. Satan says, Worship me, Jesus quotes the Bible. Even though he tells him to get away, he quotes the Bible to him. Satan falsely quotes the Bible, Jesus quotes the Bible back to him. Why? Because Jesus understands fully that in the scriptures, God reveals his will and his purpose for our lives. 
And the better you know that and the better you understand it, the stronger your toolkit is when he comes knocking. And he will. Is he knocking at your door today? You know what, Satan? One thing I like about using the overhead projector for songs, used to, I would kid people like in gospel meetings about how Satan would use a songbook to take you to hell. You ever know that? Did you know these are very effective tools for taking you to hell? Because I've seen people who knew they needed to become a Christian, and they'd stand there during the invitation song, and they'd squeeze that thing, and if it was steel, they'd have left their fingerprints in it. They'll hold on to that book to keep from responding to Jesus. And I tell them, I say, put that thing down. You're going to let the weight of a songbook take you to hell. Don't do that. That's crazy. If you need to become a Christian this morning, Satan's going to give you 500 reasons not to. He's going to give you 500. No, he may just give you one if it's worked. He'll just tell you you don't need to do it. What did Jesus say? Jesus, why do you need to be baptized? Because it's what God requires. That's pretty plain. If you're not a Christian, turn your life on sin. Turn your heart to Jesus. Be baptized into Christ. Be a part of God's family. If you're a Christian, you're not where you should be. You need some prayer about it. We're here. We love you. We sing for your encouragement while we stand together.